Hello, everyone. My name is Craig Davis, and I am a member of the Committee on Geological and Geotechnical Engineering, and will serve as your moder your webinar moderator today. Uh, the Committee on Geologic and Geotechnical Engineering is also known as CAGA. CAGA is a standing committee on the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, Medicine, and Medicine Board on Earth Sciences and Resources. CAGA was established as the local point within the National Academies for Government, Industry, and Academia on Technical and Public Policy Issues Related to Earth Processes and Materials, Soil and Rock Mechanics, Responsible Human Development, and Mitigation of Natural and Human uh, hazards. If if you have any questions about CAGA, please contact Samantha Magsino, uh, the National Academy Staff Director of the committee. Her um, email will be posted on the chat. Uh, the webinar is part of a quarterly webinar series. This webinar is uh, produced by CAGA through the support of the National Science Foundation. The webinar will be posted on YouTube. An announcement will be sent out when it is available. Uh, open your chats for messages from us and for the speaker bios. We will have time for questions and answers um, to the panelists have given their talks. The audience can submit their questions anytime using the Q&A tab on the Zoom panel for the screens. Please do not submit your questions using the chat. Use the Q&A tab. We will pose as many questions as time permits to the speakers. Uh, a disclaimer. Any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by the panelists or anyone during the webinar are those of the individuals and do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, or Medicine. Sam Magnusino and Emily Bermudez set up the webinar and are producing it. Our speakers today are Lori Johnson from Lori Johnson Consulting and Robert Olshansky, Professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. They will be presenting on post-disaster context considerations for engineers. So Lori and Rob will provide a brief self-introduction during the presentation. So uh, Lori and Rob, please take over the webinar. Can everyone see that? Craig, Rob? Yes. Yes, it's good, Lori. Great, thank you. Uh, and good morning or good afternoon to all of you or wherever else you may be in what time zone you're in. Um, well, Rob and I are really excited to be here today. I'm gonna kick things off uh, and um, we're gonna just toggle back and forth uh, through this presentation. Let me see here. I am not advancing. Here we go. Uh, so we're going to have three parts to our presentation. The first is really what we're calling the context, some basics about the post-disaster uh, period of time and, and space and how that's different from normal communities uh, and normal times. We're going to illustrate those comments with some examples from our research and practice uh, and then wrap it up with some comments about uh, insights for engineers working in the post-disaster context. Uh, so we are drawing a lot on uh, a book that Rob and I did in 2017, which really is a compilation of a great deal of our, our joint collaborative research over 30 years. Um, and that book is available for free download at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. It's just lincolninst.edu. There are two versions of the book, as we show here. And the reason Rob and I are urban planners, uh, but we, uh, as we got further into our research, we realized that um, we wanted to share something with those uh, observations from our events that were really around the issues of management and governance of large scale disasters. Uh, and uh, that's what this book is designed for. It's really to summarize the cases and provide insights for future uh, 
prime ministers, mayors, uh, governors, presidents who might have responsibility for a catastrophic urban disaster like all of those that are listed here. So you can see the six countries that we featured um, and focus on in the book, the US, uh, China, Japan, Indonesia, India, New Zealand, and the different events from those disasters. So we'll be drawing from some of those and also talking about some other uh, recent research that we've been doing together. Uh, so as I mentioned, we've been collaborating for over 30 years. Um, here's just a little time mark to show our aging process. Uh, but uh, we are both urban planners with a background in geoscience um, and have really been um, got into this field with an interest in geologic hazards and how we deal with them in the built environment. Um, my experience has been both in research and actual management um, and planning uh, pre and post disaster. And Rob, as Craig mentioned, is a, pr a professor emeritus of urban planning at the University of Illinois, uh, but also has a practice background where he worked uh, leading a geologic uh, 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 consulting firm uh, for a period of time as well. So um, that I think we're ex pretty excited today to share how we think about the field, uh, especially for geologists and geotechnical engineers uh, and their work in post-disaster uh, periods. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Rob at this point to just walk us through some of the basic observations that uh, we wanna share with you in thinking about the post-disaster period. Rob? Great, thanks, Lori. Again, it's great to be here today, and uh, let's let's jump in. So, um, the key, what really distinguishes disaster recovery from um, normal urban development, is what we call time compression, and it's the compression of urban development activities um, in time and in the space of the disaster. And this is just a little um, uh, conceptual diagram that reminds us that when we have a disaster, we lose everything right away. And so that's, you know, the structures, infrastructure, services, all that stuff goes away quickly and it needs to all get put back much faster. And so if you think of normal urban development processes, we do all this much more gradually. And so it's this, this, this key fact that everything needs to happen quickly um, is really the key characteristic of post-disaster recovery. And there's a whole lot of um, characteristics of post-disaster recovery, but they are all different symptoms of um, time compression. So next. Um, so time compression creates effects over space and over time. Um, so over space, there are differential effects across the place of disaster. So, you know, the different things are coming back at different times. Some things might be moving to other places um, and that make it physically different than, um, than other places in normal times in a variety of ways. Over time, uh, different activities, for example, construction, communication, funding streams, retail businesses being able to start up, um, all of these things actually, um, they compress at different speeds, which creates sequencing and coordination challenges. So in addition to just this overall time compression, we sort of refer to um, this um, sequencing and coordination difficulty as time warping. And time compression, as I think you can imagine, creates both challenges as well as opportunities. Next. Um, just very quick overview of you know, how this works. How does disaster recovery work in urban systems? Well, it, so normally cities are built by many different actors. And by actors, we mean all different scales, individuals, organizations, governments, non-governmental organizations, and so on. And recovery is no different. So sometimes people think what we really need is some kind of a recovery czar. And um, that's that's not how we do things in normal times. We always have lots of different actors acting, and that's the way it is after disaster as well, um, but they're in time compression. So we think of it as a self-organizing system of mutually informed actors operating in compressed time. And we, um, you know, as a metaphor, we use this ecosystem of builders metaphor um, is, is often useful. So the, the key ingredients of recovery are information flows and money flows. So the information flows typically uh, between actors, although sometimes from outside, um, and money flows from external sources. And these are the things that really, that, that these are like the nutrients that feed the ecosystem of builders. Um, but sometimes these flows are out of sync, which again um, gives this um, a time warping. And again, there's a whole lot of manifestations of this that um, 
that we don't have time to go into right now, but we'll see them in the examples. Um, so um, just the previous slide, I think I had, um, uh, right, yeah, so the right, so they have implications for the various actors. Okay, next slide. Um, so one of those implications is that we need to deliberate and act simultaneously. Um, deliberation needs to begin right away while all the participants are acting. I'm sure we, we all know the, the, um, the metaphor, um, uh, having to uh, build the plane while flying it, which is not really desirable, but this is in fact the way that we need to um, approach um, post-disaster recovery. So um, it, basically there's, there's three major ways to be able to um, think and act at the same time. Um, one of them is to increase knowledge and you can do this by hiring more professionals, involving more stakeholders, and, and basically you're, you're um, flooding the system with information. You're overcompensating for, um, for this um, warping um, by, by just putting a lot more information to the system so that even though things are still going fast, you can be smarter. Um, the second one is another way of doing that, is decentralizing information and decision processes so that a lot of different stakeholders can deliberate and act at the same time. So again, this is a way that we can keep going at, at high speed, but, um, but make that process more intelligent. Uh, but sometimes we can't really do it that effectively. So a third way is, um, is we iterate by, we act first on easier issues, and some things we can't really act that fast on. So we can delay action for a few particularly troublesome areas. Um, and then finally, in some particularly challenging situations, a uh, spatial dispersion or relocation uh, is an option, which is that that you know often it's just easier to 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 not rebuild things as they were, um, but to but to put stuff in other places. But um, this only works if certain conditions are met. Next. Um, and so, what are some of these challenges of relocation? I think really the main thing is that to understand that residents balance the hazard map against the other risks they face in their lives. And those are access to livelihoods, access to cell health and other services. Um, and, you know, really often we, we think of, um, you know, we, we, we have the map that we create with the red zones and, and so on. And we think that people should not live in those areas. And most residents, they understand that but they have to balance that against all the other risks they face. And as a result, after they do this balancing, many people prefer not to relocate at all. Um, we need to remember that communities are social and economic networks. Sometimes we think of them as, as just buildings or, or infrastructure, hardware, physical things that we need to move. And, and, and indeed, those, those are there and those are challenges. But even more challenging is, um, is moving social and economic networks. And that's really what cities are. The physical hardware is really just um, things that, that serve and enable those social and economic networks to work. Um, related to this, residents also have cultural, symbolic, and emotional attachments to place that um, make them reluctant to move. And, and finally, I just want to remind everybody, this is an important point, that acceptable risk is a, is a personal decision. So again, you know, we often will create um, uh, scientific hazard maps and, and really any uh, probabilistic maps are, are scientific. But as soon as we put colors on those maps and we decide what are the red zones, what are the orange zones, what are the gre green zones, um, we're, we're putting our judgment into that. We're, we're doing, using our definition of acceptable risk. And that may not be the same as the definition um, that individuals and communities use. Um, and so that's it's all it's socially determined. And in, um, importantly, it also complicates these situations often is those feelings often change over time through the recovery process. Next. So um, we've gone through that quick overview. We're going to illustrate through a few examples. And um, let's move on to the first one in Wenchuan, China. So um, I think many of you remember this a magnitude 7.9 uh, Wenchuan earthquake in May of 2008. Um, it was enormous. It affected 100,000 square miles. Um, there were 87,000 fatalities. And initially, at least, it displaced nearly one and a half million people, which is, um, anyway, very, very significant disaster. OK, next. Um, so there was a. Um, three-month reconstruction planning effort. So they, they wanted to move quickly. 
And this is really an example of um, how to, if you're moving quickly, how you can um, you accelerate increasing knowledge. And so national agencies and provinces mobilized, mobilized literally thousands of professionals um, to do planning, to do geologic investigation, to do site analyses. It was, a, it was a really an unprecedented effort. Um, and for, there was three primarily affected provinces. Um, they prepared a general reconstruction plan and also had 10 specific topical plans within that. Um, and they were able to release a comprehensive reconstruction plan for review on August 12th. So basically three months after the event, um, which was a significant achievement and only done because they really invested, the entire nation invested in, um, in applying increased knowledge um, to this case. So uh, next slide. Um, so another notable aspect of this was the pairing system. And what this did is they, um, they paired Eastern provinces, uh, the, with wealthier Eastern provinces with the, um, there we go, with the um, with the affected counties, so there was a one for one match, one province to one county, and they were required to uh, provide a certain amount of funding. But in addition to that, they brought personnel into it. So they had you know various uh, government experts, their um, universities, and so on. Um, they really brought each province brought all their resources to bear on um, on working with that county, and so this both. Is a good is a really good example of decentralization as well as increased um, capacity and 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 increased knowledge, and basically think of it as if you just had one pipeline coming from Beijing um, to all of those affected counties, that would just there would it would just it would anyway it would not flow as easily. But by decentralizing, um, we got a lot more different parties involved, and they could all work simultaneously. On, um, on rehabilitating all those different affected counties. Next. Um, and this is just an example of the land suitab a land suitability map that was developed for the reconstruction planning process. Um, as a result of this, they identified two towns that they um, did recommend for relocation. Um, each one of those is a complicated story, but they, did, um, they worked on both of those. Um, next slide. And this is just an example of this is uh, Beichuan, um, one of those two towns, and had these two two landslides. Um, and, and they not only did they did they uh, damage a lot of buildings and take lives, but um, they also at one point um, dammed up the river there, which caused uh, flooding as well. Next. Uh, so this is so again they went very fast. The two pictures on the top are the new town of Beichuan, which was approximately, I think, 25 kilometers away um, from the original town. Um, and they built it within three years. And the photo on the bottom uh, shows what it looked like in 2017. Next. Um, but so this was an impressive effort, um, physical reconstruction in, in a really fast amount of time by applying the various principles that we talked about. Um, and so this physical reconstruction was really a huge success. But again, there th different things compressed differently in time, and they were able to apply all of their resources to the physical reconstruction. But um, the process did not really sufficiently emphasize um, economic recovery and livelihoods and or analysis of how to do economic recovery and livelihoods. And so as a result, both the tourism district, which was one part of the economic rebuilding, um, and the industrial park in New Beichuan, which was really where they intended to um, uh, provide most of the jobs for the for the residents of the new city. Um, both of these were still mostly vacant um, as of my last visit there in, in 2017. Um, the next example in, in Taiwan, uh, Typhoon Morakot, which was in August of 2009, this was a enormous record-breaking rainfall, two to three meters of rainfall um, in four days. Most of this, I think, was in, in three days. And you can quickly do the math and, and think about what, what that might have done. It caused a lot of flooding, a lot of landsliding. Over 500,000 people were initially displaced. There were um, nearly 700 fatalities. Uh, and you can imagine all of, the, all of the many types of damage that occurred as a result of that. Next. 
Um, and so there were, um, you know, again, a lot of people were initially displaced and, um, and a lot of landslides in the mountains. And there was a goal to provide permanent housing quickly and sort of in reaction to uh, issues uh, that Taiwan had had with temporary housing um, after the Chi earthquake of 1999, they decided to really accelerate this process and provide, really try to reduce the amount of time spent in temporary housing and produce permanent housing as quickly as possible. Um, and some of this was going to involve relocation because a lot of these um, villages up in the mountains were seriously damaged by landsliding and to provide housing quickly, they would have to have to move them. And so they um, they instituted a process where they evaluated 291 sites. So these are places that both had landslides and had the potential to have future landslides from future um, uh, typhoons. Um, and they found 160 of them unsafe. And these were designated as in, in national law as special zones and they required them to relocate. And just to give you an idea of the speed of this process. So in nine days in, in September, um, which was really shortly a month after the event, the government investigated 64 indigenous villages determined 33 um, as unsafe um, and 33 conditionally safe. And then for a month from November to December, they investigated 89 indigenous villages and determined 60 of them to be unsafe. And this is both a, 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 a positive and less positive example of, um, of bringing more knowledge to play. So they obviously had to mobilize a lot of people to be able to go out and investigate these places. But the investigations were were pretty fast, and and uh, some of them it, for some of the towns they were really quite cursory. Um, they just made visual investigations in a very brief amount of time and made these really significant decisions as a result. Um, and so there are both positive and negative results of this. So um, of the nineteen thousand residents in those special zones, um, so about sixty one percent of them have actually relocated. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. And um, so they so they had to build these relocation sites really quickly. Um, they built uh, 30, 3,559 housing units on 43 sites. And just to give an idea of the speed, 47 of these were complete by the end of 2010. So that's like a year and a third after the typhoon. They had almost half of these um, relocation housing units were completed and ready for occupancy. And by the end of 2011, nearly 80% of them were complete. Uh, next. And just I'll just one quick example so we could get an idea of, of what happened here. So this is in uh, Taiwu Township. And you can see the original village site on top of a hill up in the mountains. Um, and they could have their traditional um, lifestyles there. They grew coffee. And then they were moved really fairly close by. Um, the new location there down in the valley. So it, it's, it's close by, which is great, but you can just see from, um, from this, this view that is an extremely different environment. Next. And again, on the left, you can see bits of the old town. Um, in the upper right, you can see the new. And in the lower right, what is that? That's a bus that the village owns. And what do they do with that bus? They go back and forth between the old site and the new site. So they didn't really, you saw that number earlier, that 61% of the people have uh, actually relocated, which means a number of them are still living back in the, um, in the original village site, even though it was mandatory relocation. And the reality is most of the villages involve some mix of either permanent relocation. Sometimes some individuals live in both places um, they conduct various levels of farming and tourism at the old village sites. And so despite this whole process and the mandatory relocation, they're still basically living in both places. And this is really common in a lot of the situations we, we see elsewhere. Um, next, and now we're on to Lori. Great, thanks, Rob. Yeah, I'm gonna briefly talk about uh, the New Zealand earthquake sequence of 2010, 2011. While this is an image of the uh, earthquake striking um, in the February 22nd, 2011 event, there was actually a preceding event uh, called the Darfield earthquake in September of 2010 uh, that really started from a geological perspective, uh, a number of activities. So I'll just walk you through that real quickly. Um, 
Uh, so here you see on the left, just the migration of, of uh, epicenters from west to east across what's called the Canterbury Plain uh, and the number of aftershocks that were associated with those uh, main shocks of the sequence. Uh, and um, they during this time, there were repeated episodes of landslides, liquefaction, and rock falls um, affecting over 50% of the built area of Christchurch um, with a tremendous amount of settlement uh, as well as lateral spread. So both horizontal and vertical components of land change. Um, this resulted in a thousand building dem demolitions in the central business district, as well as 15,000 uh, damaged homes. Uh, and here's just some images of the impacts, uh, and you can see a visual image of all the liquefaction happening, um, some of the rock falls, uh, and what that really looked like on the ground in some of the hardest hit neighborhoods, uh, where really drainage was dramatically changed uh, because of all of this differential settlement. Uh, so what happened? Um, well, at the time, the New Zealand Earthquake Commission is also is a, uh, a state uh, think of it like insurance. It's not exactly insurance. It's a it's it's kind of a social contract uh, that provides for coverage for the first loss uh, to residential houses in New Zealand, and it also has a component for land damage. Um, this process was centralized at the time, um, where the EQC was in charge of all the adjusters for their policies and also the land damage assessment, uh, and so they commissioned a firm to start that process. Uh, they did a very quick assessment. Stage one report came out in October of 2010. A second stage report came out in November of 2010. Uh, and then they actually started working on strategies for how to deal with the area-wide damage that was experienced. Uh, and so what you see here in this middle picture is, is what was being worked on in, in the district just to the north of Christchurch uh, City Council called Waimakariri District that in that top right image there had a lot of uh, liquefact liquefaction and ground settlement uh, problems as well, where in that particular council, they were actually working through with extensive community engagement in developing a land remediation program in which they would create a set of temporary accommodations away from the areas that needed to be fixed, and they would phase the work that was being done. So the people closest to the river were going to have the work done on their properties first, and they would leave uh, while those repairs were being done, live in the temporary accommodations. Then when their work was finished, the next phase would start and those people would leave uh, while that work was being done, et cetera, et cetera. So they released that strategy in early June of 2011. Uh, and then two more earthquakes hit in the middle of June. Um, and very shortly thereafter, the government said, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this remediation kind of work uh, with this kind of displacement. And, and really, the issue was the uncertainty of the frequency uh, and ongoing sort of, you know, just uh, risk perception of these repeat episodes of liquefaction. Uh, and for the government being responsible for land damage costs, having to repair those and then possibly start repairs on a house uh, and then have to come back and do ground remediation again became an untenable uh, financial uh, decision for or uh, option for them. And that is why the government opted to actually zone the areas of most heavy, heavily damaged that they've viewed needed area-wide solutions in order to be uh, uh, repaired uh, and to offer a buyout. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the impacts of that. Also, the areas that weren't in the red zone were there was a green zone where you could just basically move forward with your life, but there was also um, a yellow zone. Um, and this is an example of that iteration. You know, so an area has now been declared red. Uh, and uh, and an area has been declared green. So those are easier to resolve to some extent. Um, and the area that was harder to resolve got uh, uh, subzoned, so to speak, into technical categories uh, where investigations in TC3, for example, um, technical category three, meant that there had to be an engineering design for that property. Um, and you can see the number of houses in each of these categories. Uh, and this this really created uh, another challenge for those for the one for the capacity of the engineering community to support what was going on in the uh, evaluations of uh, damage and uh, repair designs for downtown buildings, 
um, work uh, now also ensued in looking at repair design line, designs for these uh, TC3 and in some cases TC2 properties. Um, so it increased uh, costs and time. Uh, and I just want to note, there's another really great example of increasing knowledge uh, uh, with the stronger uh, Christchurch infrastructure rebuild team uh, that was going on simultaneously. Um, and this is where kind of the point that Tom, uh, that Rob made about time warping comes into effect, where you have one group working on infrastructure repairs, and they now need to, as they've designed their plan, they now need to receive or did have to receive this information about the red zone and figure out how they were going to adjust their plan um, to meet that new uh, policy decision. So this was an alliance that really sort of helped spread the risk, uh, reduce the time from design to delivery by having teams already uh, on board, engaged in the design and planning the delivery and implementation simultaneously. Uh, they undertook over 700 projects to repair the basically the, what they call the horizontal infrastructure, the water, the wastewater, the stormwater, the roads, bridges, and retaining walls, um, all within a five-year program. As a result, um, some challenges uh, or some um, uh, Things they had to give up along the way were, were uh, enhancements uh, that they that were initially proposed. Um, and so there was definitely more modern materials used. There were some seismic improvements that were used, but but certainly some of the vision of the resilience and and transformation of that infrastructure couldn't take place in such a compressed time frame. Uh, and the residential red zone only had temporary restoration of, of services. So what are some of the outcomes of this? Well, this initial red zone really, you know, when the government made the policy, it was about not repairing the land damage to the residential houses that it, it was obligated to do. Uh, so there were initially just two buyout schemes for the residential land and the land and the structure of residences. Uh, but they... Uh, there were a subsequent set of lawsuits because residential land, any community, as you know, will have neighborhood serving commercial uses. There will be churches, schools, other lands within that zone. Uh, so the government was forced to actually um, offer, extend the buyout offers and develop policies for how to uh, buy out vacant land, insured commercial properties, and some of these other uses that I described. Um, some property owners elected not to sell. Uh, and the infrastructure services uh, were, had to be maintained, even if temporary, to provide services to those individuals, although threats of decommissioning have persisted uh, and probably will uh, initiate in some of these areas soon. Um, the complexity of the TC3 foundation designs really affected the timing of the ability of those neighborhoods to recover. Property values were affected as a result. People didn't want to buy into a TC3 neighborhood. Uh, and there was blight as these houses sat abandoned for a number of years while the design and the, uh, the insurers and everybody are involved in figuring out that solution. Um, so some statistics there about uh, also the fact that all of this differential settlement increase the vulnerability in some places for additional for future liquefaction and also increase the vulnerability of flood risk. Uh, and the last thing, which is sort of thinking a little bit more broadly and longer term, is just around uh, the fact that there was all of this took place at a time when a whole bunch of people were coming to Christchurch to work on the rebuild. The houses, some houses were being bought, bought out. So those people were looking for homes in competition with the workers who were looking for homes in competition with the people who were having to move out uh, for uh, repair related work uh, while their houses uh, underwent that uh, engineering designs and repairs. Um, so this really constrained the housing market. It led to homelessness. It led to further displacement and it led to price hikes uh, that lasted over two years, uh, both for rental and for sale properties. Um, until eventually new housing construction caught up and the repairs caught up. Um, and the planning and reuse, the amalgamation of rights, when you have all of these different easements and things, um, took a very long time to do. Um, and that process of sort of figuring out the reuse, even as parklands, is still ongoing today. So now I'll just briefly talk about Japan as well. Let me do a time check. 
uh, with the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami happened just uh, not not even a month after the Christchurch earthquake of February 22nd. Uh, it was devastating to a huge region in Japan. I'm going to take you real quickly through an example of what that what that was like for one particular community, Rikuzen Takata. Um, it was a small community. Uh, you can just see the widespread devastation in the valley after uh, after the tsunami. Um, well, here we have a, a increasing knowledge example uh, with also the goal of decentralization. So the government convened what it called a national de reconstruction design council. It included uh, planners, architects, engineers of various types to come together and put a strategy together for the rebuild, sort of a set of guidelines for all of these different communities to use. Um, and they actually came up with sort of what we call a two level approach for dealing with future risk. Um, the first level was really that in the area where uh, that was vulnerable to more of the probabilistic one in 100 year level tsunami would basically be, uh, we would remove all housing from that area. Um, and so life safety was the goal in the 100 year uh, zones. Uh, and then other, the thousand year measures would be what were called more soft measures, um, but relocations up into the hills uh, and uh, and uh, enhancing evacuation and other kinds of uh, warnings for people that lived in those areas to make sure that they uh, uh, that life safety was protected there as well. Uh, so how did this work on the ground? Um, here's a plan for Rikusat Takada that showed basically a, a moving of everything up into the hillside areas and land raising down in the central part of that lower elevation that you saw in that aerial view earlier uh, that had been so devastated with the construction of really significant seawalls at the front of, of the harbor. Uh, so here's an image of that lower area being cleared in 2012. Here's the massive land uh, raising operation that was put in place uh, where land to build the new hillside sites as it was being cleared and leveled was then that ground was pumped down to be put into the lower elevation area uh, and raise that land up. Uh, and here you see just in 2021, so 10 years later, that reconstruction of the seawall uh, has now been completed. But this is a very transformed community, no longer seeing um, the coast as it had before. Um, and these are mostly fishing and uh, you know rural coastal communities that really had a strong relationship and ties to the water that have been significantly transformed as a result of this policy. Um, and here's just another view looking towards in that flat area um, and the issues of repopulation, uh, population that left during all of this change has not necessarily come back. It's an aging population in general. Um, and so there are social fabric and economic issues that are persisting and challenging that um, the recovery uh, across the region, um, but ex uh, exemplified in this case as well. So now turning it back to Rob. Great, thanks, Lori. So I'm just going to give you just a little taste of uh, one that we're currently working on. Um, so this was a um, earthquake um, in September 2018, a magnitude 7.5 earthquake in Palu on the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia. Um, and so it had um, very strong shaking. Um, but the, more importantly than that, uh, were really two key phenomena that happened. The first one was a tsunami. Um, in the bay that had occurred with no warning and caused many fatalities. Um, and it was some combination of the a fault rupture um, in th through the length of the bay, as well as it triggered um, a lot of submarine landslides. And so some combination of those things caused the tsunami to occur within just, you know, less than five minutes um, after the earthquake. And so people had no time to get away. Um, and the second one was this really um, unprecedented liquefaction flow slides, you know, where, um, again, many fatalities here. This happened in, there were uh, four or five really large areas um, where this occurred. Um, and it was sort of the, the liquefaction, the liquefaction started and then the ground moved and it's basically level ground, 0.5% slope, um, basically turned into liquid and, and flowed, um, which is a pretty, pretty dramatic occurrence. And I think many of you, um, Many of you know of this, and perhaps some were on the gear team that might have um, gone there afterwards. Um, in any event, so there were these two phenomena, the tsunami, the liquefaction, um, that were both really unusual 
Um, and um, and we still don't really completely know all the um, all the causes of them, and they both cause many deaths. Next. Um, so um, this poses real challenges for um, for reconstruction and recovery. And so the unique aspects of this case and why we're really interested in it was uh, the first one is that these hazards and either one of these would have made this a really interesting case, but there are two of them um, here and they were both deadly, which means when we think of all the things that might um, warrant relocation, um, that having having something, uh, a, a phenomenon that, you know, that instantly occurs without any warning that kills people um, is usually the sort of thing that we would we would absolutely not want to have anybody living in those locations. So this argues very strongly for relocation. But um, conversely, um, their livelihoods, specifically fishing and irrigated farming, directly, geographically, directly coincide with these hazardous geographies. Um, so the, the fishing along the coast and irrigated farming is, is exactly you know where the liquefaction was and um, and it and it um, exacerbates it, and so this sort of situation where livelihoods depend on location, this usually warrants some kind of on-site adaptation, um, provided you know it depends on what the risk characteristics are. So and so in turn, so we need to figure out what are the risk characteristics, and and for both of these phenomena, the future risks um, remain unknown, again, for both of these. Now, we know a lot more than we knew five years ago. And again, I think maybe some people um, uh, listening have, have been involved in some of those. But there is still no really complete consensus on the causes of, of either of these, or more importantly, the future probabilities. And so we really don't have the information we need to be able to either rebuild in place or to relocate or to move to the orange zones or the yellow zones or any of those other things on the map. But time compression, so, I mean, people need to, they need to have their homes and livelihoods again. So, um, so they had to create a plan and they had to rebuild in compressed time. So um, there's a lot of challenges here and we're still, we're working on this and it's, um, it's uh, stretching our minds. Um, uh, it, it doesn't, it, 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 it we're using this to really help to refine the the theories, the things that we we talked about at the beginning here, um, and 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 I and we are coming up with some I think really helpful new ideas that are helping us to think not only about this case but about um, to to expand our thinking on a lot of the previous cases. So just a little flavor of our current research, and I'll turn this back to Lori. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, so we'll just wrap up quickly here and go to some questions. So some thoughts for your consideration as we close down um, our presentation. Reflect a set of core principles in all post-disaster work. And these are, I think, different from maybe the way as technicians we often think about our principles in doing our work. Uh, the first is the primacy of information, just how important it is to get information out and get it out uh, very broadly uh, stakeholder involvement. This doesn't mean necessarily just citizens. Stakeholders, uh, in the case of uh, New Zealand and Japan and other places, it also involves uh, insurers. Uh, it involves uh, the structural engineers and the contractors. Uh, there's just a whole number of people that are part of the process of recovery uh, that need to be involved in these decisions. And the last is transparency. Um, uh, just very, very important to be transparent with the work. And I, I think we've seen some really good examples of that uh, in these cases as well. Um, understand that a time compressed environment process may be especially illogical and confusing and expect inefficiencies. Um, it is just what happens. When we worked in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, we actually budgeted an equal amount and even more in the end for communication than we did for the actual technical work on the recovery plan for the city. It just costs a lot to go fast. We were trying to go fast in a four-month time period, um, and we needed to have lots of communication to do that. 
Um, you can manage the effects of time compression by doing the things that we laid out. Uh, and essentially, those are different approaches for planning and acting simultaneously, increasing knowledge by having more professionals involved in the process, decentralizing the information and decision processes, and iterating by acting on the easier items first. Um, you can increase capacity um, that also provides that deliberation and knowledge. And as we noted about transportation, ultimately enhances speed. Um, and it also engenders trust. And although speed's important, please remember that recovery should not be a race. Uh, and now about relocation, uh, our views are that uh, relocation of residents and communities uh, should happen in, when it's really focused on the public safety and welfare uh, being at risk and only with full participation of residents. You really, through that process, begin to understand the issues that we've tried to lay out here around livelihoods, the relocation of access to resources like health, uh, schools, et cetera, uh, and get a more comprehensive and preferred solution ultimately uh, by having a bigger picture view than just focused on risk. Um, as Rob mentioned earlier, uh, recognizing that everybody is making their own risk decision uh, and you and it really helps to have an engagement process and understanding the various needs and preferences. Um, if you clearly communicate options to people, you can increase your influence with that persuasive, uh, trustful communication. Uh, and we encourage people to use multiple methods. It's just not in this kind of uh, environment practical uh, or useful to just uh, or results in a good outcome by just publishing something on a web or in a federal register. Uh, you really need um, multiple methods of engagement. Um, and lastly, be aware of the context as we're trying to um, allude to here uh, and illustrate here with these cases that there's a broader social, historical, and political context um, in every area that we work um, and um, seek opportunities and be alert to the possibility of being manipulated by powerful interests um, or just the, you know, the pressures of time compression as well. So with that, we're going to wrap up and... Um, we thank you uh, for your time, and now I'll turn it back to Craig to lead us in Q&A. Well, Rob, Lori, thank you. This was excellent information. I, I suggest very useful. Hopefully the audience finds it that way as well. Uh, we have several questions uh, that I'd like to pose to you and maybe create some kind of conversation that will last hopefully beyond this particular event. Uh, one I'll start with is on your concept of time compression. Uh, that seems to be a great observation and principle to understand. How do we educate people on this concept and what are methods that we can utilize to employ the concept? Lori, I think maybe you addressed some of the part about employment, but I'm, maybe we could focus a little bit on how, how do we get the word out? How do we educate people on how to do this? Yeah, um, you know, we have started in the United States, we have the GEAR, the Geotechnical Extreme Event Reconnaissance, and that's now broadened with funding from the National Science Foundation for the science, social or uh, structural engineering, social science, a number of other ears that now exist. Uh, but there's something that kind of knits them together called a converge that is really talked about sort of cross-cutting issues. Uh, like ethics in disasters, um, doing interviews with people, making sure that people are understand safety. Um, and I think that, that time compression is one of those issues as well that really could be ripe for that kind of training um, within the ear network um, and converge offering. Uh, and, you know, we speak about it in our professional association work. Um, and, you know, I think that's just also where, you know, maybe the training that GEAR does when it re recruits new, new members to participate in uh, reconnaissance and EERI and all the other entities could could provide some in, um, information as well. So I, I, I kind of smiled when you asked that question, because that's what we're doing right here. Uh, we do try to give <laughs> uh, talks on this to as many different audiences as possible. And we we use every opportunity possible to uh, speak to planners. Um, and when we when we when we uh, study uh, disasters, um, invariably they ask us to give a talk so they can learn about other cases. And so we're 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 carrying this everywhere everywhere we can, all the right places as much as we can. Um, and I think you know, uh, so the, the idea of time compression is important, but the implications of it are really important. And one of the things that I think we mentioned many times here was um, expanding um, the channels of information. 
Um, and and I think both of us mentioned that that costs that costs money. You have to invest in it. And so typically in recovery, you know, you're really going to budget. You're going to count. You know. How many how many buildings were lost and and you know and how much pavement needs to go back and so on and the budget is based on that but you've got a budget for these uh, for all kinds of things um, having to do with information flows technical assistance planning all of those kinds of things and as Laurie mentioned um, sometimes that's going to cost even more than you know than the uh, you know some of the technical things that you have to do. Um, and so that, to me, is is one of the big messages that we have to keep repeating. And and I'm telling it to this audience, and maybe some of you will carry this message to other places. I, I think that's interesting, Rob. We are actually part of the answer <laughs> to that yeah, question. Exactly. That, that's good. That's good. It's staring us right in the face. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned gear and steer and the other reconnaissance teams, um, but you're your your research is focused more on the implementation of actual recovery. Can you explain the difference between what the scientific investigations that gear and steer uh, and others like it undertake versus the the recovery itself that you were getting at? Sure, I'll I'll start out. Um, Gear, having been on the advisory committee for Gear for a number of years, you know, Gear really began because of the need to capture perishable information, uh, and and do that before the recovery, the repair, the restoration processes start, uh, and that is, uh, you know, in the spirit of which the app, the grant application was originally submitted to the National Science Foundation for Gear, and specifically, uh, it was to allow uh, the geotechnical community to come together has some decision-making process around um, the priorities and needs for an investigation in an area and be able to uh, go out and, and conduct that quickly and efficiently. Um, what we study, as you see, is long-term. Uh, and I think uh, there's you know, a really interesting project that Rob and I co-led for, for EERI, the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, which is what was called a resilience observatory. And the, the, the goal there was to really look at how do you observe resilience, because re resilience is really a, a concept. It's a benefit, a dividend that's realized in the moment and after the moment of disaster. Um, so we need to observe resilience over time. Uh, so what it means in reconnaissance is not just looking at the things that got damaged, but also looking and spending you know a lot of time looking deeply at the things that weren't damaged and why, and making sure that the reconnaissance effort and, and does that. And um, for the most part, I think we do a pretty good job of that. But then also documenting um, the resilience benefits that don't happen just in that immediate moment of disaster. They happen through redundancies and, and you know, the, the rapidity of planning and the rapidity uh, at which restoration can occur uh, and the transformation and adaptations that are made uh, in that post-disaster period. So, you know, I think that it's it's extending our view from what we think about in that immediate reconnaissance to, to sort of looking at immediate reconnaissance as laying the foundation for ongoing reconnaissance. And that means we have to kind of shift our funding schemes as well for that, because we really, it is valuable to go back five years on and, and look at the kinds of early decisions that are made and how they played out of time. What were the cascading consequences uh, what cha what changes had to be made, you know, to some of that early mapping um, and insights that that you know were made in that early time compressed period. Yeah, I'll just I've, I pretty well covers it. But I'll just add a couple of things. Yeah, we, we're really interested in looking at the context, looking at uh, sort of broadening the view of things over space over time, um, but but really importantly, looking at um, the decision processes and the effects of those decision processes because that's how we learn. Um, for 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 future events, and really focusing on the um, the communities and the lives of the people. So, like as a, infrastructure, for example, um, focusing. I mean, the hardware is obviously really critically important, but focusing more on the receiving end. So, people, what kinds of services do people get from the infrastructure, and how does that work, and how does that affect communities, as opposed to the, the focus on the hardware? And then, um, you know, Lori mentioned this effort with ERI, and I do want to point out that. Um, Palu case is directly um, is uh, is directly a result of that. So um, it was one year after the um, one year after the event, um, we went on a um, EERI reconnaissance, sort of 
one of one of the first ones where we're really doing this sort of resilient reconnaissance um, sort of view over time. And as a result of that, we we got some interest and have gotten some additional uh, some research funding, mostly through the Japanese members of our team, and we're continuing to look at it. But that whole project was um, was initiated by um, by ERI's interest in looking at this. Oh, very good, very interesting. Um, we have a question here related to your your broad international work. Uh, so what should engineers be thinking about when responding to disasters in different countries and cultures? This is multi-part, so let me hear it through, or please hear it through. Does the political system in place affect how the disaster decisions are put into practice? More authoritarian governance systems uh, might be better able to execute their top-down decisions where the uh, where one would expect a greater number of popular exchanges and iterations leading to less rapid recovery process. I can repeat some of that if it's, it was too long for you. We were able to see it, and thank you for that question. You know, I think what we what surprised Rob and I when we wrote the book was uh, the comparative analysis of the different governance structures and what some of the outcomes were. And so, while uh, mention of China's authoritarian system and New Zealand had a very centralized process with a national department created, there have been a lot of uh, you know there were a lot of impacts from that as well because of um, the the, to some extent, a lack of local experience that that a national government will have. Land use and you know actual construction and economies are often quite you know quite localized in terms of how they work, especially uh, you know at the community scale. And so, one uh, the more centralized, often uh, the lack of insight there may be to really understanding you know, the practicalities and the realities on the ground of how people live in their community and what's valuable to them. Uh, so I think, you know, what we found, though, across all of these cases was that aspects of government um, and how those were managed by government, regardless of the political structure, uh, was really important um, and consistent across these cases. And think of them as four levers Money, obviously, if a government has money, <laughs> you know, that is a lever you can sort of feed into the system and fuel recovery. And as Rob has been saying, information is a second fuel for recovery. But the other two things that are are levers that can that need to be pulled and that we're trying to kind of illustrate here is collaboration, sort of that broader engagement uh, in decision making. You get better decisions when you hear uh, more of the disparate views and have a better context and understand uh, that, you know, the context, the local context, everything else that, that I'm describing. Uh, and the second one is managing time, just recognizing that time is something that you can manage, that it is, it you know, yes, decisions and actions um, and the pressure to make them quickly, um, you know, exists post-disaster, but it's also, you you know, you can, you can, manage that the way we described, but you can also slow it down, take more time to deliberate when you need to so that you can speed up later. Uh, and so thinking of time as, sim as similar to how you manage money and information uh, and engagement, um, we saw that as being the success more than necessarily how centralized or decentralized it was. It was really how those governing actors uh, manage those four components. I was a a thorough answer. I just I, I thought it was a very astute question, uh, particularly with regard to um, different kinds of political systems. And the quick answer is yes, they absolutely do affect it. And that's when we talk about the context is really important. And um, I, I just want to say that authoritarian systems can um, re reconstruct um, faster, um, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily providing a better recovery. Because again, the um, the community is made up of people and and uh, social and economic networks, and those to in to really um, rebuild those networks, um, the people involved in those really need to be involved. So so sometimes an authoritarian system can make it visually make it look like the reconstruction happened more quickly, um, but sort of the deeper aspects of recovery may actually be done more effectively in. Um, systems that involve more community involvement. 
All right. So uh, we're, we're running short on time. So this could be the, the last question. Uh, I'm going to slightly twist what is, is written here. But um, you, you gave lots of experience uh, that you've you've acquired over these different interviews and studies. Um, are you finding that the the work that's being implemented is from the local knowledge, or are they reaching out uh, a minimum across the country to acquire the knowledge? Say Taiwan or China. Well, China. I, I'm thinking mostly in Taiwan. Or even across the the uh, the different parts of the world, can you maybe add a little more insight than what you had on on that particular issue? So I'm not completely sure I have the question, but but I'll say that places, um, uh, you know, so every every place again has a unique context, unique history, unique culture, um, and to some extent, um, uh, uh, really to a very great extent, we need to leave. The recovery decisions up to their hands because they know what works for them, but they haven't they haven't had an experience of a catastrophic disaster before. And there's a lot of things that they can learn and that they do learn from the other places that have been that have been through this. And you know, sometimes we struggle with this issue of um, you know every every disaster is unique and it's unique to its circumstances. Um, so that would suggest that we can't learn from other places, but absolutely we do. It's it's really amazing. I think Lori, as Lori mentioned, um, even in really dramatically different political systems, different cultures, and very far flung parts of the world, human beings collectively, really and individually, they have the same concerns, the same issues, and there's there's a an enormous amount um, of lessons that we learn from one place that applies to everywhere else. Okay, Lori gives that the thumbs up. So I I'll give Rob the last explain. word. Great, thank uh, you. I apologize if I didn't explain it well, but Rob, you did an excellent job of providing the information that I was hoping you would bring forward when I asked the question. So good, I'm glad. Yeah, I but, just whether it seemed like we're in sync, we were. Go ahead. I just say, just you know, there are like capacity issues on a technical level, and I think there's been some great examples where international. Uh, advisors have been engaged with uh, with local uh, local technical experts, geologists, engineers, et cetera. And, and those are the cases we try to really call out and highlight, you know, is really that you're building that capacity in that in that impacted country to to manage um, the decision making process, not having outsiders come in and do it for them. Okay, well, at this point, uh, I think we need to go ahead and uh, wrap up. So I'll start by thanking everyone for joining and listening to Lori and Rob. I want to give special thanks to Lori and Rob. You did an excellent job of sharing uh, some very useful and valuable information to this group. I want to thank uh, Kaga and the National Science Foundation for sponsoring this, and of course, National Academies. Uh, and then lastly, just remind you of our disclaimer that the opinions, conclusions, recommendations, and so on expressed are, are those of the individuals and not of the National Academy of Sciences. And that lastly, the webinar will be posted online and information will be sent out when it is available. So with that, uh, I again thank you all and I conclude this webinar. <laughs>